and delighted to welcome you all to graduation. I have a few announcements to make before we begin so that you can relax and enjoy the ceremony. Graduands, an easy job to start with. Please check that your seat number matches the number on your ticket because you'll be called to the stage in this order. If you discover that these don't match, our team of stewards can help you locate the correct seat. At the appropriate time, you'll be invited by the stewards to stand and to make your way to the foot of the stairs, ready to head up the stairs and across the stage. All very straightforward. There are two key things which make for a seamless ceremony. Firstly, as soon as the person ahead of you begins to cross the stage, please make sure you make your way up the stairs. Don't wait until they've passed across the stage before you reach the top of the stairs. Secondly, don't let excitement and pride overwhelm you so much that you forget to pick up your degree parchment after you've crossed the stage. If you do, don't worry, you have still graduated. But don't try to go back because you will collide with someone coming the other way. Instead, please visit the graduation information desk in the exhibition, exhibition centre where you collected your gown and tickets 30 minutes after the ceremony to collect your parchment. At the end of the ceremony, graduates are asked to process out of the hall directed by the stewards. Family and friends, the stewards will show you to the exits once the graduates have left the hall. If the fire alarm should sound at any point, please remain in your seats. Instructions will be given and we will escort you to the nearest exit. As graduates, you will join an international community of over 123,000 alumni in 183 countries. The York Alumni Association organizes many events, networks, and services designed to help you make connections with alumni across the world and boost your career prospects. After the graduation ceremony, please visit the Alumni Association stand and photo booth in the exhibition center where you can pick up your graduation gift to welcome you to the association. As you get your first job or take further study or training, please remember to keep us in touch with what you're doing. Understanding the career paths that you take will help us provide the right support for current students and make sure we offer graduates like you relevant information and opportunities. Finally, please turn your mobile phones to silent and will you all now please stand.
Good morning, and on this cold but lovely Yorkshire day, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the university. Please be seated. I now declare this congregation open for the conferment of awards. So again, good morning and welcome to this very exciting day, which is a special milestone in your lives. It's also a wonderful time of year for everyone who works in the university. It's really inspiring to see so many happy and proud people here today. I want to offer you my warmest and most sincere congratulations. Gaining your degree from a world-class university like York is a tremendous achievement. It shows just how much you have devoted your best efforts to your studies. The university is enormously proud of you, as are your families and your partners and friends, and indeed everyone else who has supported you in your time here. When you made the decision to come to the university, you made a choice that is likely to have a lasting effect on your life. As I'm sure you know, there are many reasons why people decide to go to university. Perhaps you came to York because you wanted to prepare for a career in a specific field, or to improve your employment prospects. Perhaps you came because you were passionate about your subject. Or perhaps you simply came to university because you wanted to be independent and leave home. Whatever the reasons, we hope you achieved your personal aims and ambitions. In recent years, the public discourse around higher education has moved to being universities as drivers of economic growth and the role of higher education in delivering productive workforces. Whereas such constructs are undoubtedly important, we should not lose sight of the much wider relevance of higher education for society. Education is a common good that benefits us all in ways that may be difficult to measure, but are certainly no less important. Education enables societies to work together, to build together, to live peacefully together. Education protects us from extremism, intolerance, and prejudice. Fundamentally, education makes us all better people. I hope that you use your new skills to the benefit of people and societies worldwide. Now, I hope you've enjoyed your time at the university, which I'm sure was not all spent on hard work and intellectual contemplation. I have seen and heard you having a wonderful time in your colleges and indeed in the city. And I'm, of course, also aware, albeit in part, on what goes on through social media. Instagram holds few secrets. And you know what all of this says about you? It shows that you are, on the whole, a lively, sociable and caring group of people with a great zest for life. And so it should be. Being at university is about much more than study and work. During your time with us, you will have met people who will hopefully remain friends for the rest of your life. You will have joined student societies or explored new interests. You will have experienced life in a community that is diverse and truly international. I think you'll find that these experiences have been just as valuable as any formal learning in shaping who you are and what you can become. Since 1963, we have inspired over 130,000 people to cross both this platform and continents and to embrace almost every imaginable job and profession. Now it's your turn to go out and explore new horizons. As soon-to-be graduates, you are now part of our worldwide community of alumni 
with members from 183 countries in the world. Our global A to Z directory ranges from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. I hope that you'll be able to join us at events across the globe and to support many of our important activities. Whether joining a professional network or volunteering time as an online mentor, there's everything for you to participate in. One key part of our work is philanthropy, where we come together to support areas such as scholarship, which open doors to education for students who've overcome immense difficulties to be here. I'm delighted that the class of 2019, you and your colleagues, have chosen to support equal access scholarships and have raised £6,000 to help this important cause. Thank you for doing that. It's a tradition that speeches at graduation ceremonies close by offering much well-intended advice to inspire graduates. Well, actually, I'm not sure you particularly need my advice, but there are some things that probably matter more than anything else. First, try to be kind and compassionate to other people because kindness and compassion underpin civil society. Second, never forget that the world is a very interesting place. Never stop questioning and trying to understand it better. Third, make sure you enjoy whatever you do and have the courage to change direction if you don't. And finally, be lucky, but remember that Louis Pasteur said that chance favours only the prepared mind. So for now, I wish you all well. Make us proud and, above all, always strive to be the best you can. And being your graduates, I'm sure you'll also have a great time along the way. Many congratulations and good luck for your future. Thank you very much. Vice-Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Archaeology for research in the proteomic and isotopic analysis of parchment, Sean Paul Doherty. <laughs> for research in comparing heritage values in asset transfers, Katrina Foxton. For research in the rock art landscapes of Rombold's Moor, Vivian Deacon. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Archaeology of Buildings, Rebecca Millman. <laughs> Richard Powger. Bethany Watrous. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Conservation Studies, J. John Yang, Jack Chan. <laughs> Rachel Joanne Melville. For the degree of Master of Arts in Conservation Studies, Historic Buildings, Paula Bubitska. <laughs> Rowena Cray. <laughs> Irini Christina Dimaruki. <laughs> Alana Hogarth. Samuel Woodford. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Cultural Heritage Management, Lucy Ainsley. <laughs> Christopher Berryman.
Sarah Bottomley. Bethany Rose Cadell. Blaise Catley. Jesse Clark. Vivian Cooling. Rachel Edwards. Katrina Gargett. Anne-Marie Hoyk. Charlotte Hughes. Jacqueline Janssen Van Dorn. Janet Jones. Darcy Lloyd. Anna Martelli. Joanna Meredith. Akane Nakamura. Megan O'Mara. Leah Purser. Tom Reed. Isabel Richards. Matthew Richardson. Connor Rowbotham. Matthew Rowland. Charlotte Selby. Ellie Tom, Rina Sugiguchi. Hannah Thompson. Emma Wake. For the degree of Master of Arts in Field Archaeology, Jonathan Farley. For the degree of Master of Arts in Funerary Archaeology, Daniel Boothby. Kate Brooks. <laughs> Roisin Downing. Catherine White. For the degree of Master of Arts in Medieval Archaeology, Natasha Corkin. James Crawley. Marina Jenner. James Osborne. Samuel Whitaker. Edwin Wyatt. For the degree of Master of Arts in Mesolithic Studies, Yasmin Menemenli. Bethany Nash. For the degree of Master of Arts in Prehistoric Landscape Archaeology, Roger Cleverley. For the degree of Master of Science in Bioarchaeology, Lucy Ather. Lauren Basnett. Carlo Cocosa. Christopher Eaves. Mary Lucas. Shannon Marsh. Catherine McRae. Javier Montalvo Cabrera.
Elizabeth Nicholson. ID Sue. Amy Steele. For the degree of Master of Science in Digital Heritage, David Farimond. Sierra McKinney. Christopher Wakefield. For the degree of Master of Science in Early Prehistory and Human Origins, Miley Dubroy. Isabel Wisher. For the degree of Master of Science in Funerary Archaeology, Emily Walker. For the degree of Master of Science in Zoo Archaeology, Kimberly Hosking. Kawisara Kaiprasat. Riley Ray Lembo. For the Bachelor of Arts in Historical Archaeology, Emily Wager. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Matthew Perrault. Vice Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in English, for research in Shakespeare and the Renaissance reception of Euripides, Kyla Sodron. For research in Senses and Spaces and First World War Medical Care Narratives, Marie Allett. <laughs> For research in Carol's Alice books and Cognitive Narratology, Francesca Arnavas. <laughs> For research in Anne Radcliffe's post-1797 works, Elizabeth Bobbitt. For research in literature and the choreographic imagination, Megan Girdwood. <laughs> For research in the narrative integrity of fictional autobiography, Yu Hua Huan Yen. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Culture and Thought after 1945, Georgia Garilli. James Hakeney, <laughs> Chelsea Hayes, <laughs> Sienna Holmes. <laughs> Alice Eilith Miller, <laughs> Patrick Light, <laughs> Freya McCreary. Nicola Peard. Jake Tattersdill. For the degree of Master of Arts in 18th Century Studies, Rachel Campbell. Annie Harrison. Olivia Kepex Jones. Sebastian Saniel. Gemma Sykes. Emma Tranter. For the degree of Master of Arts in English Literary Studies, Maria Eugenia Albonico. Jocelyn Bates. Carolina Elisis, Brantley Fraser, Sophie Jackson, 
Jade Jenkinson. Phoebe Power. Jake Richardson. Victoria Ruskins. Amy Smith. Georgia Smith. Linda Tarto. For the degree of Master of Arts in Film and Literature, Ewan Brooke. William de Chazel Rasmussen. Sam Kaufman. Rebecca Mannion. Christopher Owen. James Wright. For the degree of Master of Arts in Global Literature and Culture, Cheryl Rome. For the degree of Master of Arts in the Literature of the Romantic Period 1775 to 1832, Michael Howarth. <laughs> Mary Comness. <laughs> George Neem. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Medieval Literatures and Languages, Kaylee Fletcher. Bo Kyung Kim. <laughs> William McLean Smith. <laughs> Rachel Patterson. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Modern and Contemporary Literature and Culture, Emma Adami. <laughs> Anka Carter Timoff. Matthew Chesters, <laughs> Eva Corchado, <laughs> Melanie Groot, <laughs> Gabrielle Kendrick, <laughs> Jake Logan, <laughs> Benjamin Meyer. Elizabeth Sidrani, <laughs> Lucy Swift, <laughs> Aaron Tegelman, <laughs> Vlad Toma, <laughs> for the degree of Master of Arts in Victorian Literature and Culture, Evie Brill Papard. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in English, Kayleigh Butler. <laughs> Bartholomew Hayden. <laughs> Colette Holdsworth. <laughs> Rory Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen, Ensemble Eanonymy will perform words by the real group, followed by Road Home, arranged by Stephen Paulus. of the beggar and the king. Everybody, every day, you and I, we often say words. We've got it as a complicated tool, created by man, implicated by mankind. Words, obsession of the genius and the fool. 
Everybody, every day, everywhere, and every way. Well, words, find them, you can use them. Say them, you can hear them. Write them, you can read them. Love them, fear them. Words, transmit it as we fit it from the start. Received by all, and we're sentenced to a life with words. Impression of the stupid and the smart. Everybody, every day, you and I, we often say words. Inside your head can come alive as they're said softly, loudly, modestly, or proudly. Words, impression by the living and the dead. Everybody, every day, everywhere and every way. Oh, words, find them, you can use them. Say them, you can hear them. Write them, you can read them. Love them.
Acting Vice Chancellor and President, it's an honor and a privilege to introduce our honorary graduand, Francis Morris. Since 2016, Francis has been director of Tate Modern, Britain's gallery of international modern art and one of the world's most significant and influential museums. Having begun her career as a curator at Tate in 1987, Francis has played a key role in shaping the gallery that she now directs, one that continues to lead the field in rethinking the role of a public gallery and ways in which audiences engage and interact with art. It's now very difficult to imagine the situation at the start of her career with no Tate Modern. Then, visitor figures for Tate as a whole were not even a tenth of what they are for Tate Modern alone today. Contemporary art struggled to find regular representation in the program, and international meant something from just over the channel or North Sea. To have got to this point required a huge amount of foresight and a series of brave moves against the background of considerable public skepticism. Preparing this address gave me a chance to refresh my memory of the run-up to the opening of Tate Modern at the turn of the millennium. A survey of the commentary in even the well-informed section of the media reminded me how stuck in certain uh, mindsets many of us were. The idea of converting a power station into an art gallery horrified many critics and concerned letter writers to newspapers. So just some of, the, some of the things I found are actually, it would become a giant folly. The gallery's collection would not stretch far enough to fill it. The bankside, bankside um, back, backwater was far too off the beaten track to attract large numbers. What we should have is an authoritative fixed display in a conventional building. Well, the reality, over five million people found their way to Tate Modern in its first year alone. There they were able to explore an innovative set of, of new presentations overseen by Francis in her role as inaugural head of displays, ones which completely rethought the chronological survey of styles and movements still dominant in museums of modern art elsewhere, by imaginatively pairing historically canonical and more recent artwork. The sublime space of the Turbine Hall incorporated an extraordinary installation by Louise Bourgeois, commissioned by Francis, titled I Do, I Undo, and I Redo, an appropriate metaphor for the continual process of remaking that Tate Modern has subsequently come to stand for. None of this dropped out of the sky in the year 2000. It was the result of key steps taken much earlier. One of the most important was the establishment of the Art Now Room in 1995. In the 1990s, Tate endeavored to find more consistent place for contemporary art in its permanent collection and temporary displays. But Art Now marked its full embrace and a dedicated space co-curated by Francis. It featured a frequently changing program of shows by upcoming artists such as Miroslav Falka and Doris Zazevo, who later went on to receive Turbine Hall commissions and much greater public recognition worldwide. The same year, Francis co-curated the exhibition Rites of Passage, Art at the End of the Century, which not only characterized the current concerns of contemporary artists, it looked ahead to what they might be in the century to come art that confronted issues, artists engaging with questions of technology and the body, of identity and sexuality, of displacement and memory, questions that have only become more pressing today. As Director of Collections International Art from 2006 to 2016, Francis guided the ever greater diversification of Tate's holding. The institution that began in 1987 as the National Gallery of British Art now has a global collection and reach. Under her directorship, Tate Modern is moving ahead again in new directions that will set a model for others, matching the global ambition with strategies to democratize the organization, working with members of the local community, its associates, who play an active role in programming and events through Tate Exchange. Let us not boast like Augustus, who claimed to have found Rome a city of bricks and left it marble, but it's fair to say that Francis has been at the heart of turning the 19th century museum into a truly 21st century one. So for her contribution to the, to the curation of modern and contemporary art, and as a museum director of world standing, acting vice chancellor and president, it is great pleasure that I present to you Francis Morris with a degree of Doctor of the University Honoris Causa.
absolutely splendid. Um, I'd love to thank the university for this um, honor. It really is a, on a, a tremendous pleasure. And Michael, uh, Professor White, for your incredibly kind words. I'd like you to write my obituary. Um, I was taught art history at a time when people still spoke of great masters, believed that there was a fixed canon of Western art, and actually felt that this art was intrinsically more important, somehow central, and more advanced than what lay beyond. But as I made my way in the world after graduation in the 1980s, in the wake of the first wave of radical feminism, the first post-colonial revisionist assaults on history, and alongside the beginnings of the so-called new art history, my generation began to realize that much that we had been taught, much of the value system we had inherited, was in fact contingent, historically conditioned, framed by structures of race, gender, and class, humanities, the subjects I love, those that you have been studying, led the way, replacing criticism with critical theory, contesting cultural values rather than merely confirming them, broadening and diversifying our histories, taking down borders. Since then, over 30 years, I've traveled the world. I've been intimidated and captivated by the likes of Louise Bourgeois and Yayu Kusama, I've made discoveries and developed obsessions, explored in essays and exhibitions. There have been many highs and not a few lows. With exploration, of course, comes risk. And it's that exciting sense of opening up art and the discussion around it that has been, for me, a principal driver in my career. I came, uh, became director of Tate Modern just weeks before the Brexit vote. How ironic, I felt, to be relaunching Tate Modern with a brave vision of the interconnectedness of global cultures, of a museum metaphorically without walls, just as the people of our four nations voted to withdraw to the periphery of Europe. How strange and troubling for you, students of the humanities, to graduate today into this world of diminishing horizons and flattened perspectives. You're graduating at a time when those values that have underpinned your endeavors here, curiosity, open-mindedness, honesty, fun, values that universities exist to foster, they seem especially vulnerable at a time when borders of geography, wealth, race, and faith are ever more present and more corrosive than at any time that I myself can remember. Even so, it's clear today that you are rightly full of hope. John Berger, uh, the writer and critic of that great book, Ways of Seeing, if you haven't read it, read it, which back in the 1970s really shaped my own understanding of culture, he understood the importance of hope. Hope, Berger wrote, is not a form of guarantee. It's a form of energy, and very frequently that energy is strongest in circumstances that are very dark. And I've been reminded of that paradox again and again over recent months, seeing the work of colleagues across the UK, visiting artists in their studios, colleges, universities and schools, and witnessing the activities of grassroots organizations and young people in and around the cities of the UK. So all of us, graduates of the humanities, have a great opportunity. How amazing it would be to rebuild our trust in culture, to get down from our ivory towers, exit our echo chambers, relinquish our exclusive vocabularies. Shortly after I was appointed uh, director, a journalist asked me what my vision was. So struggling to articulate, find words, the, the song was very apt struggling to articulate something strongly felt, but as yet by me unsaid. I described Tate Modern as a university with a playground attached. A university? I was thinking of the enduring importance of research and scholarship in driving us towards new and more open frontiers of knowledge, to new understandings. And a playground? 
I had in mind experimental and imaginative thinking, play, making, central to cognitive development, to creativity, and on to sociability and joy. And for me, these are really not separate things. For me, the museum of the future binds them together, encourages an easy and reciprocal transition between the two, where deep research can be lightly worn and learning can be the outcome of play. So all of you have spent years here in the university finding your voice. Now you have to go into the playground to grow it, refine it, and use it, while allowing others their voice. And this is key, listening. My business, the history and presentation of art, has taught me that innovation, excellence, risk-taking, comes not from doing it your way, or indeed my way, but from doing it our way, with conversation and collaboration arising from trust and openness. So, go out there, make stuff happen together. We will be waiting and watching and with you. Thank you. Vice Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in History. For research in the declines of alchemy and astrology, John Clements. For research in maternal and child health and decolonizing Fiji, Sarah Claire Hartley. For research in women's clothing in 18th century England, Elizabeth Spencer. For research in international health, development, medical mission, Benjamin Walker. For the degree of Master of Arts by Research in History, John Anderson. Elliot Banks. Joseph Turner. For the degree of Master of Arts in Contemporary History and International Politics, Catherine Allsop. Mario, Marios Antonin. Frederick Boron. <laughs> Daniel Goldstraw. <laughs> Sophie Holmes. <laughs> William Kitson. <laughs> Eleanor Knight. <laughs> Mingyun Lee. Jake Louth, <laughs> Yu Yang Lu, <laughs> Catherine Orr, <laughs> Stefano Simini, <laughs> Matthew Twin, <laughs> Emily Whitfield. For the degree of Master of Arts in Early Modern History, Chloe Adams. <laughs> Jessica Ayres. <laughs> Erica Felipe. <laughs> Amy Louise Fleming. <laughs> Sarah Holliday. 
Rhea Hughes. <laughs> Harry Morris. <laughs> Adrian Salomon. <laughs> Anna Turnham. <laughs> Eleanor Watson. For the degree of Master of Arts in Medical History and Humanities, Charlotte Bean. Sarah Birch Ares. Carlos Eduardo Campani. Daria Hartman. For the degree of Master of Arts in Medieval History, Ariane Louise Beardshaw. <laughs> Hanwan Chen. <laughs> Christopher Dickinson. <laughs> Tracy Hall. <laughs> Sarah Maloney. Matthew Orgill, <laughs> Bethan Owen. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Modern History, Kurt Baird. <laughs> okay. Correction. Degree of Master of Arts in Medieval History, Joshua Poole. For the degree of Master of Arts in Modern History, Kurt Baird. <laughs> James Baker. <laughs> Richard Chappell. <laughs> Jared Durrance. <laughs> Matthew Garland. Matthew Haig, <laughs> Toby Mings, <laughs> Jonathan Sharman, <laughs> Rebecca Taylor, <laughs> Benjamin Walker, For the degree of Master of Arts in Public History, Lauren Harrison. <laughs> Leanne Blue Hodgkins. <laughs> Rena Hoshina. <laughs> Kyla Hislop. <laughs> Georgina Kimberley. Daniel Knight, <laughs> Rachel Moore, <laughs> Chloe Price Lonsdale, <laughs> Jessica Redhead, <laughs> Elaine Rhodes. For the degree of Master of Arts in Renaissance and Early Modern Studies, Caitlin Burge. <laughs> Charlotte Evans. <laughs> Anastasia Iltifidou. <laughs> and Andrea Paquin. <laughs> Jimena Ruiz Maron. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in History, Louise Brohan. <laughs> For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in History and Politics, Jay Khan.
Vice Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in History of Art, for research in visualising AIDS, Ilaria Grando. For a study of sculpture in the Chantry Bequest, Amy Harris. For research in York Minster's Chapter House and its painted glass, Hilary Moxon. For research in the Caryatid in Britain, 1790 to 1914, Kieron Rua O'Neill. <laughs> For research in funerary sculpture in the Spanish Restoration, Chloe Sharp. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in History of Art, Tabitha Atio. Jessica, Jessica Davis. Zorcha Dean. Suzanne Forty. Susanna, Susanna Galbraith. Charlotte Hone. Isabel Jaffrey. <laughs> Megan Corey. <laughs> Adele Cormanic. <laughs> Barbara Lodge. <laughs> Christiane Matt. Kristin Neubauer. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in History of Art, Architectural History and Theory, Susanna de Ander Amador. <laughs> Rosa Hansel. and Nadini Binti Nordin. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in History of Art, British Art, Samantha Scott. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in History of Art, Medieval Art and Medievalisms, Felicity Cook. Lily, Lily Seach. Charlotte Thompson. For the degree of Master of Arts in History of Art, Modern and Contemporary Art, Francesca Curtis. Lizzie Lewis. and Katrina Mann. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Stained Glass Conservation and Heritage Management, Olivia Smith. Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and Linguistics, for research in asymmetry in infants and adult speech perception, Mariam Dar. <laughs> for
for researching aspects of comparative constructions, Maria Margarita Macri. For researching variation and change in the vowels of Achterhoots, Melody Patterson. For the degree of Master of Arts by Research in Linguistics, Ikali Kostopoulos. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Comparative Syntax and Semantics, North Green. <laughs> Charlotte Sant. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Linguistics, Murta Bortolotti. Heather Turner. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Phonetics and Phonology, Leonie Walter. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Psycholinguistics, Isabel Bayman. <laughs> Cho Chin Lin. For the degree of Master of Science in Forensic Speech Science, Alison Cameron. <laughs> Bexley Fisher. <laughs> Francesca Page Hippie. <laughs> Elliot Land. <laughs> Kaylee Peters. Benjamin Gibreed. <laughs> Alex Stevenson. <laughs> Rebecca Whitby. <laughs> For the degree of postgraduate diploma in forensic speech science, Matthew Turner. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in English Language and Linguistics, Lauren Beckingham. Vice Chancellor, I have the honor to present the following candidates. For the degree of Master of Arts in Medieval Studies, Maxwell Botherus. <laughs> Erin Bunce. <laughs> Scarlett Dennett. <laughs> Alice Finley. <laughs> Siobhan Flynn. Sarah Hines. <laughs> Alexander Kidia. <laughs> Gabrielle Kramer. <laughs> Isaac Lawton. <laughs> Megan McDonald. Charlotte Josephine Mackenbach. <laughs> Nicola McNeil. <laughs> Alison Russell. <laughs> Daphne Slob. <laughs> Sophie Spendlove. Isabel Staten. <laughs> and Claire Walsh.
Vice-Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Philosophy for research in Moral Arguments and the frege Gish problem, problem, Raphael Silverio da Versa. For the degree of Master of Arts by Research in Philosophy, Elena Byrne. For the degree of Master of Arts in Philosophy, Matthew Diss. Sean Hamill. Jack Harvey. Ed Willems. For the degree of the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, Adafi Jaja. Chris White. Vice Chancellor, I have the honour to present the following candidates for the degree of Master of Arts in Digital Film and Television Production. Nachiket Burave. <laughs> Ruth Brooks. <laughs> Tsing Hui Sai. <laughs> Guo Tiang Tsui. <laughs> Yui Dai. Samuel J. Daniels. Juan Angel Hernandez Moreno. Anna Ayosef. Chen Xi. Oliver Spaulding. Constantinos Spanomaridis. <laughs> Rohan Tang. <laughs> Gui Hung Wang. <laughs> James Willis. <laughs> Singyu Yang. For the degree of Master of Arts in Post-Production with Sound Design, Ruggiero Ginzelli. <laughs> Katie Hallett. <laughs> Felix Jaeger. <laughs> Andrew Jones. Natakorn Q Yamnong. <laughs> Daniel Lofthouse. <laughs> Ewan Marshall Atherton. <laughs> Andrea Michael. <laughs> Liam Norton. Javier Rueda Estrella. <laughs> Molly Sewell. <laughs> Lewis Williams. <laughs> For the degree of Master of Arts in Post-Production with Visual Effects, James Blow. Bianca Casinelli. 
Jessica Eid. Rachel Johnson. Emma Snadden. For the degree of Master of Arts in Theatre, Writing, Directing and Performance, Sophie Buckley. Diogo Gonzalez. Claudia Nather Jaime. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Theatre, Writing, Directing and Performance, Emma Whitworth. And for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Film and Television Production, Harry Souter. And Vice-Chancellor, I have the honour pr to present the following candidate for the degree of Master of Arts in Medieval Studies, Hayley Shard. <laughs> Vice-Chancellor, I also have the honour to present the following candidate for the degree of Master of Arts in History of Art, Esther Corey. I also confer awards on those graduands who elected to receive their degrees in absentia. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Ellie Knight, our student orator who will speak on behalf of the class of 2019. Our student orators have been invited to speak in recognition of their hard work on behalf of the student community and commitment to their studies. Our speakers have both pursued the most enriching experience they could during their time at York, as well as giving back to their community. On behalf of the class of 2019, I give you Ellie Knight. at York as a nervous fresher, I was convinced that everyone here was smarter than me, wittier than me, more attractive and more likeable. But now I'm standing here at my master's graduation, overwhelmed by how far I've come. I've studied history, English literature, politics and ethics. I've written 20,000 words on a subject I adore, played a multitude of sports. I've had an article published in Italian, I've made friends for life and tried to help others when times got tough. I've had so many opportunities. Thank you, York. Five years I've been here now, polishing, swaying, considering and shaping words, like pebbles which are smoothed by the tide. There have been countless debates, discussions, revelations and arguments, each lesson, each heated exchange, each theory reflected on, dismissed or accepted, has brushed in like the tide and left its mark. I've been lucky, I know that. Not everyone will have had the same experience as me. For some, it might seem that just pushing through to this point is the real achievement. Perhaps, considering the sacrifices you've made for study, it feels, as, it feels as though you've not accomplished very much with your time here at York. But that, that does not mean you've not been productive or gained anything valuable from your time here. And in surmounting this incredible challenge, what is key? is that we must not look on this as a failure to do more, but as the huge achievement that it is. I love this place because it has allowed me the chance to grow and change, to become a more confident, reflective, and I hope a more considerate person. I hope that looking back, you too can see how far you've come. University life is full of highs and lows. I won't pretend there are no issues. Many of us here have struggled with depression, anxiety, homesickness. Last year, I worked as a college tutor and witnessed even the most accomplished students battling personal issues on a daily basis. However, through support from the university welfare teams, support from friends and family, through individual perseverance, grit and a passion for our subjects, we've all made it this far. 
to everyone here today, graduates, staff, families, friends, I tell you this, you are all brilliant. You're smart and kind and wonderful, but it's okay to not always feel this way. It's okay to have days when it's all too much and you just want to cry. That's life. But for today, I ask you to be proud of what you and I have achieved, how far we have come and how far we will go. I'm now training to be a teacher, facing an incredibly intense and equally rewarding year. I'm excited to go back into the world and share the knowledge I've gained at university. But I put this to you. We've all learnt lessons, academically, emotionally, socially. It is down to us to share this collective knowledge with those around us. Never underestimate the difference you can make to the lives of others, just as they, just as they have made a difference to you. I'd like to finish with some words from Margaret Fuller, an American journalist and women's activist. If you have knowledge, let others light their candles in it. Thank you and congratulations. Vice Chancellor, we honour today an artist with a superpower the ability to manipulate time. Fade in. The shots switch back and forth from subway carriage to Manhattan apartment as Michael Fassbender locks eyes in one moment with a woman passenger and then walks naked in another moment from post-coital bedroom to bathroom. A time-bending distillation, hopeless sexual addiction to open Steve McQueen's movie, Shame. Cut to a glamorous reception. A Chinese general whispers a secret phrase into Adia Adams' ear before the action switches suddenly to 12 months in the past and a UFO landing site in Montana. Adams is now defying mass guns to phone that same phrase to that same general to save the visiting aliens, to secure the future of the world, and to solve the enigmatic meditation on time present and time past, as they are both perhaps present in time future, that is Denis Villeneuve's movie, arrival. These resonant moments of cinema highlight the work of Joe Walker, lauded as the invisible performer in the editing room, fashioner of some of the most enthralling movies of the past decade, whom we honour today. Joe once described his cutting style as seeking to realise on screen our experience of life by adding variety and landscape to the moments you want to dwell on. I would venture to suggest that Joe's distinctive approach to film structure, provocative time play, manipulation of tempo, rhythmic intercutting, owes much to this place. Joe graduated from York's Department of Music in 1984. And it was music as a discipline and musicality as an instinct that launched Joe's career. He won a place on the BBC's assistant film editing course in 1986 and quickly earned a reputation for working with sound which has continued to this day. He composed scores for BBC arts documentaries, which were performed impressively by the Royal Philharmonic in Trafalgar Square. He wrote music for TV movies and documentaries. And Joe's editing is notable for its rhythmic interplay between audio and image. The standoff on the bridge in Denis Villeneuve's thriller Sicario, where a relentless drumbeat stretches time almost unbearably before a cacophonous eruption of gunshots and, and split-second picture cuts. Steve McQueen, meanwhile, described Joe as attuned to the silences. They can be just as valuable as words. From the mid-90s, starting with the BBC police series Out of the Blue, Joe began notching up an impressive credit list. High-profile TV dramas like Jimmy McGovern's Outstanding the Lakes in 1999, Dr. Zhivago, starring Keira Knightley in 2002, and then Features. 2004's Tabloid, with the influential Scottish director David Blair. Harry Brown, starring Michael Caine in 2009. Brighton Rock, 2010. And in 2011, Joe masterminded what is truly one of the great instances of editing mind over matter. Culled from 4,500 hours of footage, 
sent in via YouTube by 80,000 contributors across the world. Life in the Day with Kevin MacDonald and Ridley Scott distilled 24 hours of global activity into one 95-minute documentary, another manipulation of time. But it is Joe's collaboration with two directors in particular that has delivered perhaps his signature work. First, Steve McQueen. With its symmetrical framing and near balletic depictions of violence, Hunger, in 2008, saw Joe, the avant-garde composer, join forces with McQueen, the Turner Prize-winning artist, to deliver an account of Bobby Sands' fatal hunger strike in early 80s Northern Ireland. It is as savage and unyielding in its politics as it is compelling in its visual poetry. The film's distinctive long takes, including a dialogue between Sands and the priest that lasts 17 minutes without cutting, are precisely juxtaposed in the edit to draw the audience viscerally into an experience of slow time and lingering death. Walker and McQueen's next two collaborations are similarly meditative. Shame, and then of course the Oscar-winning 12 Years a Slave in 2013. Only in their most recent, amid the twists and temporal turns of the heist thriller Widows, has the pace increased perhaps. Just two long takes, at least by my reckoning. Joe once said that the cinematic experience is at its best when you get to really peer inside the soul. Certainly, a cutting back and forth between spectacle, scale, big ideas, and the tightly focused intensities of an individual mind have characterized Joe's other long-standing collaboration with Denis Villeneuve. Emily Blunt's moral perspective on amoral law and order operations on the US-Mexico border in Sicario, the contemplation of time, space, language, and reality that animates Amy Adams' linguist, uh, linguist and bereaved mother in Arrival. Ryan Gosling as Kay's frustrated search for an elusive humanity in the long-awaited cult sequel, Blade Runner 2049. One hopes and expects that this subtle mediation between exterior and interior will bring a success that has eluded many other filmmakers to Walker and Villeneuve's next collaboration. They'll be tackling Frank Herbert's sci-fi epic, Dune. And along the way, John Joe's uh, won his fair share of awards, four of them, including one for arrival from his own fellow editors. And he's earned numerous nominations, including two for the Best Editing Oscar. I'll put money on Widows, earning a third Academy nomination at the very least. Not bad for an artist who in his early years could not decide whether to compose or to cut, and who claims that his entire career as a master of time and meditation is based on one simple trick. If you have a shot of somebody looking very thoughtful, Joe once said, and then you cut to something, it looks like they're thinking about it. <laughs> so, in conclusion, and if Joe will permit me to borrow this trick to meditate on this precise moment in time, medium close-up, Joe Walker listening, thoughtfully. Wide shot, a packed central hall. Cut to 1984. A younger Joe Walker walks across the stage. Cut to close up, Joe Walker, thoughtful, present day. Cut through to degree scroll. Cut to now. As we recognize a York graduate's 32 year career and more to come, I'm sure, as a world class screen storyteller. Vice Chancellor, I have the honor to present to you Joe Walker for the award of Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. I hope I don't stretch time to breaking point in my speech. <laughs> um, dear graduates, Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, my thanks to Dr. Brayman for that very kind and imaginative profile. My time at, uh, at the music department at York back in the early 1980s 
had a profound effect on me. I got here on a pretty flimsy set of results from a school where the music department was a dusty cupboard with two Haydn study scores and a tambourine. <laughs> In contrast, my first encounter at the Sir Jack Lyons Concert Hall was a lavish music theatre piece by Karl-Heinz Stockhausen called Trans. It's a giant, terrifying orchestral piece um, hidden behind a large violet gauze. You hear brass, woodwind, percussion. Um, they seem to be making the sounds of a thrashing, wounded beast. And a row of string players are seen in the half light and the amplified sound of a loom crashes from side to side of the auditorium. So to say that this changed my life is a woeful understatement. It really transformed my suburb suburban mindset forever. So yes, I've spent 32 years as a film editor in the film industry, and I'm very proud of that description. It is an industry. Our aim is to communicate wide, and box office is our mojo. But we can still maintain lofty ideals. Stories are good for people. We find meaning, we make sense of the world, we look through other people's eyes, and we develop empathy. We just have to remember that fiction has consequences. What if, for example, our skills with editing software were devoted to taking a narcissistic serial bankrupt and philanderer and honing a reality show to make him out to be the deal maker of the century? an authority on business, someone almost presidential. <laughs> that would be regrettable. <laughs> so, even as I climb ever further between the collagen implanted lips of Hollywood, I'm trying to, tra to stay true to those uncompromising, gutsy attitudes I first discovered here in New York. And I'm so glad to have this opportunity to thank the university for that. Uh, I'm loath to dispense advice, but if I had any, it would be, uh, be inventive in how you tackle your tasks. Try to peer around your project from every angle. Nine months into editing a movie, I'll watch it with the image flopped, and that's just to keep my eyes fresh, or I'll cut without the sound at all. Try not to be intimidated by the scale of your task. Start somewhere and keep going. When the composer Harrison Birtwistle was asked why he started so many of his pieces on the note E, he replied, it seemed as good a place as any. <laughs> Most of all, keep your claim moist. Once you've achieved what you, want, what you wanted, what you set out to do, then hit save, but keep going. Like Stockhausen's title, Trans, transform and transcend. Perhaps the most inspirational moment I've had was watching a 1956 film called The Mystery of Picasso. And in it, we watch the artist painting directly on the lens of the camera. He creates a number of complex collages, like a beach scene and uh, several quick sketches. And in one of these, he paints a chicken. You look at the chicken and you gasp. It's a perfect Picasso chicken, rendered in one brushstroke. You could sell it for a million euros. As he begins another brushstroke, I recognized in myself a pungent sense of panic. My inner voice was screaming, don't change it, you'll ruin it. It's a perfect chicken. But a second later, his brushstroke was complete and the image is transformed into a Roman centurion. It's even better than a chicken. <laughs> so keep working, keep transforming, keep the clay moist. It's not hard. The clever thing, after all, is knowing whether what you need is a chicken or a centurion. My sincere gratitude for this huge honor, which means a great deal to me. Thank you very much.
So that's the end of the formal part of the graduation ceremony. We should congratulate Joe and Francis again and congratulate you all. I wonder if I could ask our guests, not our graduates, to stand, please. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, now is your last opportunity to congratulate and wish well all of our graduates and, and wish them every hope and uh, endeavour for the future. Please. One last task. Can I ask our graduates to now stand? So as, as you know, you, you haven't made this journey alone. You've been supported by academic staff, by support staff across the university, by friends and family who've supported and nourished you and given you occasionally money. Now, <laughs> now is your opportunity to say thank you to those people who've helped you. Please. Thank you all very much. Please remain standing. I now declare this congregation closed.